Welcome to episode 113 of the Dirty Christian Podcast. I am Drew, and I am the Dirty Christian. It's Sunday. It is the 25th, I believe, of February of 2018. Um, Real quick, before we get started, uh, if you have a chance to, go ahead and check out thedirtychristian.com. You can subscribe to the blogs there. Uh, Try to blog uh, at least weekly, not all the time. Uh, Am I consistent? But... Uh, I try I try the best that I can. Um, also, check out Facebook. If you're not watching this live on Facebook and you're listening later, uh, check out Facebook.com slash The Dirty Christian. Uh, same with YouTube. I'm on Twitter as well. Not as often. I wish I was on Twitter more, but I'm not. Uh, and uh, let's see. Then also there is, uh, you go to Patreon.com slash The Dirty X-I-A-N. I think it's The Dirty X-I-A-N. Maybe it's The Dirty Christian. Patreon.com slash The Dirty Christian. Uh, if you want to support what I do here uh, on Facebook, uh, on the blog, on the podcast, uh, if you want to support it and you and you have it, if you, if you have the ability to do so, uh, consider um, becoming a patron. You get to join the... TDC patron only discord channel and you also uh, for $15 you get a TDC uh, I'm a terrible person shirt Um, so that's up to you if you want to do that uh, don't feel obligated you know it's just a way that you can help support me Uh, if I you know there are there are moments where uh, I hope to one day uh, upon my retirement from the the Navy that uh, I could do something like this full time uh, podcasting or blogging or just making videos. Um, I don't think, I, you know, I, I don't know if that's a sustainable dream. Uh, I don't even know, like, I don't know if that's even the right type of ambition to have. Uh, we've talked about ambition before. Um, so I don't want it to be, uh, for the wrong reasons. Um, I just kind of, you know, I'm ultimately okay with just being kind of content with, with what the Lord ends up doing, uh, with us in the future. So, uh, anyway, you know, if it turns into something that uh, you think you can support or want to do, uh, by all means, uh, you know, consider it uh, or, or don't. You know, just by at a very minimum, you know, your prayers for me are uh, super helpful and I do appreciate you guys doing that. Uh, so I want to talk about two things today for this podcast. Um, I initially was just going to talk about um, sheltering your kids and, and parenting uh in in that way where you kind of shelter them uh in, in which usually gets kind of a, a negative connotation where a lot of people don't like the idea or, or you you hear the term sheltering your children um and a lot of times societal wise you kind of get this image of like these ki- these weird kids that like grow up and not knowing how to socialize with uh with other people or they just don't know how to be out in public, um, I'm going to present to you why I think that actually sheltering your children is a good idea, especially as a Christian, uh, but we'll get to that. Uh, but, but another thing, it it dawned on me, I've been wanting to do this for a long time and I, and I, I realized that I hadn't really talked about it, uh, before, but I wanted to talk about faith and I wanted to, I, I did kind of a social experiment a while back, uh, on YouTube where I asked a question of atheists. Uh, and the question that I asked them, and the video that I posted, and it's actually uh, one of the higher amount of views that I've, I've gotten, which is interesting. I got more views asking atheist questions than I ever did, like, just making videos for Christians, uh, which is just kind of interesting to me. Um, so, I asked the question, the video is called My Final Question for Atheists that they won't answer. Obviously, it's a little clickbaity title, uh, kind of on purpose, but um, I asked the question... That if you knew beyond a reasonable, like, shadow of a doubt, if you knew 100% that the God of the Bible existed, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you knew it. You knew it, no questions asked, uh, would you worship him? 
and uh, and I and just just as I had expected uh, the answers to be, they they were exactly what I thought they would be. And and here's what I'm going to present to you, right? Uh, I I believe that God gives us uh, the faith that we have to believe in Him. Uh, I believe that without God uh, softening our hearts, giving us a heart of flesh from a heart of stone, uh, that it's impossible. Uh, to nobody would have a desire to love God if he had not if he did not give us the faith to acknowledge Him in the first place. Uh, that the belief itself is not um, self-activated, but the belief is actually the belief actually comes from the Father, and then it is it is actualized in our relationship with Christ as we repent from our sin. We see our sinfulness. Uh, we repent of that sin. Uh, and we go to worship God, um, and so and that was kind of the the thought process behind my my social experiment was um, let me ask people who don't believe in God if they were given a hundred percent proof beyond a shadow of a doubt if God was real would they worship Him anyway? So I want to read through some of these questions or some of some of their answers with you. I want to. Uh, I want to go over some of these with you because I think that it's important for us to know that it's not about being convinced that God is real. Uh, that it's not about us winning an argument with an atheist to convince someone. Like debates are good, and I'm not against debates. I think I think debates are cool, um, but it's not about winning a debate as a Christian against a non-believer. Uh, to try to convince them over to the side that truly it truly is the gospel of Jesus Christ that awakens uh, the faith in someone else. That's why we're called as believers to preach the gospel to other people because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation, as Paul tells us. Uh, not winning an argument, not outsmarting or out talking someone, uh, not convincing someone that doesn't believe. Uh, to believe, because belief doesn't come as an activated thing. We cannot make ourselves believe. We cannot try out a religion. Uh, we cannot do those things on our own, right? It has to come. The activation has to come from the Lord. However, again, that's why people always ask the question, well, like, why, you know, why even evangelize if God elects and predestines people unto salvation? Why even evangelize? Well, we evangelize because God calls us to, but also because it's a demonstration of our love for others that we evangelize to them. We share the gospel with them because it's the power of God unto salvation. And that's why we evangelize to others. Uh, and I think it was Spurgeon that said it, that if we, if, if the elect of God had a, had a, a yellow and blue stripe, like a bumblebee painted up their back, then I could just lift their shirt and know that they were the elect. But since the elect of God do not have such distinction, I'll preach the gospel to everybody and hope that the elect receive the word. So, uh, so the question again, let me recap. I asked a bunch of, I asked a question of atheists. I got 500 something comments from the atheists, uh, on this question on YouTube. I said, if you knew beyond the shadow of a doubt, if you knew beyond, beyond any, question or doubt that God was real, would you worship him? And here's some of the answers that I got. And I normally I would display this on the page, but I'm just going to read these for you. You can actually go read the comments yourself on the, the YouTube channel. Uh, so number one, the guy said, nope, I would not worship or serve him. I would ap have absolutely no interest in serving a God that allows or causes atrocities such as Ebola, famine, children dying of leukemia, the Holocaust, 9-11, tsunamis, the list goes on. The Bible condones things like rape and slavery. Uh, what's even more galling is that God claims that he is good. That God will never earn a shred of respect from me. Um, okay. Uh, another person with a little bit more of a, a simple answer. No, I would not. Um, all right. Fair enough. Uh, somebody else said, um, your question is incomplete. We would need to know what this God, and he uses quotes, has done and what it expects from us. So there's a condition in order for this person. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't worship God unless I knew who this God was and what his expectations. So it's still conditional. Like, you know, oh, sure, maybe I would acknowledge that God, but uh, I would never worship him unless unless the, his expectations of me were met uh, by my own expectations of me, right? And 
it, what's interesting is I think that even as Christians, we have a tendency to do this as we create God in our own image. Uh, we have a tendency to uh, to make the to say, well, God would never do this because it's not something that I would ever be okay with. And we equate we equate the words good with what we generally understand as good. Right. And what we is, is human beings, which is natural for us to do. We usually equate things like, um, you know, never being sick or always being happy or, or having uh, having financial prosperity or having lots of friends or having a great job. Like we equate those things as good. And we generally equate death and, and sickness and, 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 and famine uh, and those type of things as bad. Uh, but. But our flaw, our view of, of what is good is, is based on our, our, what we like or what helps to preserve us. Uh, our view of what we consider to be God, or good, excuse me, um, is things that we would generally consider to be good or beneficial to us. Um, with God, we, if we if we equate if we know that God is love and God is good, we cannot then say our view of love or good, then it reflects on what God is. We have to look at everything that God has done, and that that defines what good and love is for us. Uh, so that's a you know that's always an interesting uh, interesting concept there. Um, so someone else said, um, if sufficient evidence was provided, uh, I would know that God exists, and therefore I wouldn't be an atheist. Uh, that doesn't automatically mean that I would serve or worship that God. Uh, if we assume that, in addition to proving the Christian God with 100% certainty, that you would able, you would also able to prove that everything written in the Bible is 100% true, then no, I would not serve or worship that God. Seriously, if God actually committed the atrocities detailed in the Bible, why would anyone worship that God or follow him or her or its instructions? Um, the next guy said, no, your God is uh, really cruel and evil. Uh, another person with some some uh, harsher words said no, uh, blank him and people who worship an entity that created this mess. Uh, one amazing thing about the Bible about Bible freaks is that everyone evolves around everything evolves around humans when we are outnumbered greatly by other life forms. I guess just God decided to give countless species their own unique self defense system to survive, uh, but not against any not against humans. Uh, if after countless centuries on Earth, this is what we become, all the while animals and other life forms, uh, having got nothing for their suffering, he can swallow blank. Um, if the God, of, somebody else says, if the God of the Bible were to be proved beyond a shadow of doubt, I don't think this is possible at all. Uh, then he, then we would no longer be atheists because we would no longer lack belief. The question then becomes: Is that is this a God worth worshiping? Uh, and his answer is no, no, it is not. Dawkins put it best. The God of the Old Testament is argu arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Je uh, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynist, homophobic, racist, infantis infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, lots of other words, and, and yeah. So, uh, basically... Without having to go into great detail anymore, I mean, that's just the first, like, five or six answers to that question. Um, but I think you kind of generally can see that uh, it, it's, not about, it's not about proof because these people hate God. And the Bible tells us that they hate God. The Bible tells us that we all kind of start hating God, right, before he reveals himself to us and that we come to uh, acknowledge and worship him and, and, and know and believe in him. Um you know, how is it that someone like me who who can hate murder, um, hate death, and hate all of those other things, right, can still love a God that these same people claim uh, God is, is, is overall responsible for? Uh, and, and I'm not denying that he is responsible for, but, but I have found the truth in Christ and the truth in God and, and truly seeing his plan play out that I can fully understand and and acknowledge that if God is truly God, then it's just a blessing alone that I get to live on earth, let alone the additional uh, additional blessing that I have knowing that I have eternal life through Christ because my sins have been forgiven. Um, all of those things that those people complain 
uh, and blame God for as his, as him being responsible, all of those things are the exact reason that we need Jesus Christ. All of that death and all of those things that came after sin that God has used to show us the importance of Christ and salvation in Christ, all of that is reason that I know that I need Jesus because all of those things uh, settled and rested in my heart. They were part of my nature. The murder, the death, the hatred, the anger, the the selfishness, the pride, all of that. Uh, and realizing that I, I was that way. And when I saw my sin for what it was, when God opened my eyes, like like Paul, when the scales fell off of his eyes and he saw the, the truth, when he met Christ on the road and he truly saw that Jesus was alive, he then fully understood the sin that was in his life and through sanctification went from a place of of being this great Pharisee, you know, the the least of the apostles to the least of the saints to the to the greatest of sinners. Um it wasn't until God showed us that stuff in us that made us realize. So all of those atheists, look, I'm not saying we go and bash on the atheists and we don't hate on them. Those guys, those people, men and women, they're they're exactly programmed to do what every single one of us was programmed to do from birth. They hate God. Romans 1 shows us from the beginning that we hate God. We that God is clear to us. Even you know what's what's interesting in their question is even seeing even those atheists acknowledging like for one second if God was truly God if the God of the Bible was truly real I still would hate him they hate God so it's not that they can't just activate their faith they can't just say well one day I'm going to try to believe no amount of argument no amount of reason or logic or anything like that is going to convince them to believe in God because that belief comes from the Father. As God, as Jesus Christ calls, as the Father calls us to himself through Christ, as we acknowledge Christ's existence, that hatred for God becomes a love for God. Because I can tell you point blank, I can tell you before I knew Christ, I absolutely hated God. I hated the things of God. I hated Christianity. I hated everything that Christianity stood for. I, I even grew up Catholic and hated every part of Catholicism. I hated it. I created God in my own image that I would worship and be, and I would be like, well, I can believe in this loving aspect of God. I can believe in this piece of God uh, that the Bible talks about, but everything else I reject and deny. Our default position until Christ softens our hearts is to hate God. So those atheists are doing exactly what we would be doing had it not been for the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ to save us. We would be no different from them. And our hatred for God might have looked differently. Our hatred of God might not exactly be so vocal or so so loud as a lot of atheists, especially atheists on social media and on YouTube. Uh, but our hatred of God would still be hatred of God. So we have to, so we should have mercy and we should have grace for those people because they are doing exactly what they feel that they should do. They are doing exactly what their hardened hearts uh, have programmed them to do. And they, none of those people, this is why I'm convinced in in that in the the predestination the in the election of God none of those people would be satisfied living in heaven where they'd had to worship God not one of them if God had done a, a strange experiment and brought one of those atheists into heaven to experience worshiping of him worshiping him for eternity not one of them would be satisfied they would spit at and curse his name to his face because of the hatred that they have for God. But guess what? God uses all of those things for his glory. God uses all of those things to bring himself glory. Because on the cross, he destroys sin and death. 
and for those that he's decided to show mercy and grace to, he has given us those things. Now, I've got my beautiful little baby girl here with me who she uh, she makes it down here every now and then for the podcast. So you get to look at a cuter face than me for a little while. Uh, but this is Lyndon. So, so let's talk about, I think this is a good segue actually that my baby is here with me. She, um, you smell like garlic. You smell like garlic? Do you smell like garlic? Did you have garlic? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> so I think this is a good transition to actually talk about uh, sheltering your kids because I posted something about this earlier about uh, sheltering my children. And and here's what I think. So here's... Help. Yeah. So what I think is that um, there's a, a really weird... Like, when I grew up in school, right, like... Even before going to a Christian school, because I went to a Christian school in uh, in um, in middle school, but I uh, I my mother was not a believer, uh, and so we had a very we had very interesting talks and conversations about uh, Christianity, about people who went to private school, um, people that were homeschooled, people that were sheltered. Go with Trey. It's okay. Go play. Go watch a TV show. I'll be up in a minute. Uh, so we would we had conversations about people that that uh, attended those type uh, of situations and went to schools like that and everything like that. So um, they would, my mom would make comments like, "Well, they're sheltered. They don't, you know, these people won't know how to uh, how to to react and live in society. You know, how will they how will they relate to people?" And I grew up believing that people that went to Christian schools, uh, that Christians who went to private schools, uh, would, would just be unable to relate to society as a whole. Um, and, and so I, even being a young parent and a new parent and and a relatively new Christian as a a new parent, uh, I was convinced that my kids needed to experience, uh, public school, public setting and have that socialization, uh, built in for them. Uh, in order for them to be, and, and I would use the arguments like, well, they should be, uh, you know, they should be able to, to be a light in a dark place. They should be able to know how to defend their faith. Uh, they should be able to be in those places to share the gospel. And look, I'm not saying that there aren't people, that there aren't great Christians in public schools. I'm not saying that there aren't great Christians in secular businesses, and that's fine. I'm not speaking out against that. Uh, but what I am and what I feel very strongly about is is this particularly because uh, my son, uh, he just celebrated his 15th birthday, my oldest did, and his uh, his friend came over from visiting from our old neighborhood. Now his friend, his whole, you know, his friend's family, n- not believers, not saved, um, gone through some really rough, hard times. Uh, and, and, you know, and we've tried to be as close of friends to them as we can. We've brought him to church. We brought him to youth group when we were back over there. We've talked to him about the gospel. We've just tried to be as loving kind of, uh, uh, you know, secondary parents to, to this young kid as we could. Uh, but what I, something I noticed about him while he was visiting, and it's been about a week or a year, excuse me, that he had been to come visit. Uh, and they're growing up, you know, he's, he's a teenager just like Ashton is. Uh, one thing I noticed is that he, uh, he's got scars on his arm, uh, and he's, he cuts himself. Uh, and this is not an uncommon thing in, uh, in secular society in in school today. And it just made me realize, and just so thankful, uh, not, I didn't want to be like the Pharisees, right? I didn't want to be like, well, I'm thankful that my kid's not like this, but what it made me thankful for is the influence that my children have is not an influence that comes from society in. All right? The influence that my children have comes from a gospel situation, comes from godly parents teaching them how to how to worship God, how to study scripture, how to understand the doctrines and understand the Bible and understand these these concepts of the Lord and use them practically in life so that when the day comes when they are old enough to be on their own they are old enough to go out into the world and experience culture and experience society on their own that we have, as parents have poured into them everything that we could possibly pour into them 
to set them up and prepare them for a life outside of our house. Okay? So I'm not ashamed to say that we shelter our kids because I think that every parent has an obligation to shelter their children up until the point that that child walks out that door and has to go experience life. Sheltering doesn't mean not preparing them for the world out there. Sheltering means protecting them when they are at a volatile age where they are easily influenced by other people in their peer groups that they do not become susceptible to the temptations of society to cut themselves, to kill themselves, to eat freaking Tide Pods, whatever whatever the most retarded craze is today, our children, our Christian children are growing up, they are hearing the gospel and having the word of God poured into them so much so, and they know that when they walk out the door, they know what secular society demands of them. They know what to expect from their bosses who don't believe and curse the name of God and may challenge their belief and their Christianity. But they know that their relationship with God is so strong that no outside influence, now that they've developed their worldview, no outside influence is going to break in and destroy their fragile minds like it does in society today when we put them in these situations at 9, 10, 11 and up those ages and they are become so they're so malleable and so soft and we and I love this quote by Paul Washer and I know that not every parent can homeschool so please don't don't send me messages like some do and say I can't afford to homeschool or I can't deal with homeschool. I'm not telling you to homeschool, but listen, when you when you send your kids to Rome to be taught, don't be surprised when they come home looking more and more like Romans every day. Okay? And that that's a that's a loose that's a loose translation of what Paul Washer said, but when we send our kids out into the world to be taught by the world, don't be surprised when they come home looking more and more like the world. Instead, we, we have an obligation to raise them up as believers, to raise them up as worshipers, to raise them up being ready to give an answer to the questions that people may have about the faith that they have. We raise them up so that when they go out into the world, the world cannot break them. When we send them out too early, the world breaks them and then they come home suspicious and they come home not ready to hear the word of God. They come home with problems. They come home with brokenness. They come home cutting themselves because a friend of theirs that is depressed says, this works for me. And they want to try it themselves. We send our kids to be taught by a lot of wolves. Now I get it. There are Christian teachers out there and God bless every single one of you that has to do a job in secular society where you have to maintain your belief and your faith in God on a day-to-day basis. But I tell you what, Christian parents, every opportunity that you have to shelter your child, to protect them from some sort of influence from the outside, do it. They will thank you later. They may hate you for a little while because maybe some of their friends go out and do these things that they're not allowed to go do. They may be mad at you. They may even say some harsh words to you. But guess what, mom and dad? If you're your parent's friend, you're not, or if you're your child's friend, you are not your child's parent. And we need parents. The world needs parents. Half of society that you see on social media needs parents. We all say it. We all joke around about it. But it's true. Society needs parents. There aren't enough parents out there doing what they should have done. Now their kids are eating Tide Pods and think that they everything is owed to them. Okay? To me, that's just... That's just the reality of the world that we live in. So will I will I and, and am I sheltering my kid? Yeah. Yeah, and I will continue to do it. All of them. Every single one of them I will protect until they tell me no more. And then I'll probably still try to protect them some more. 
So that's my tirade. That's my rant. That's all I got. Uh, it definitely was something I wanted to talk about, though. I've been wanting that not only the parenting thing, but I really want to talk about the atheist thing because uh, I just really, I just want you to, if, if you really have a problem with faith or understanding how belief works, go read the comments on that YouTube uh, video that I made. They don't want, they won't worship God. Beyond, they could believe and they could see God to his face and they won't worship him. They don't want to. They hate him. They would never want to spend eternity in heaven with the Lord. Period. And if you need proof of that, go read the comments on that video that it says, my final question for atheists that they won't answer. Well, they answered. And it's fascinating. And I think it makes a lot of sense. So go and read those. Maybe you'll get it. All right, so that'll be it for the podcast, um, guys. Uh, I thank you guys for joining. It's 30 minutes. I'll stick around for a few minutes for an after show. But if you guys don't have any questions, then I'm not going to uh, I'm not gonna, to waste your time out here. It's Sunday. Most of you guys were in church. Most of you guys are probably going to like a second ser- church service or something. Uh, so you spent enough time with me today, uh, and I appreciate it. Uh, love you guys. God bless. I'm closing the podcast out. I'll stick around for a few minutes. Uh, Dirty Christian out. 